evening. Um, earlier this year, the monthly co-op book group read Food Rules, an Eater's Manual by Michael Pollan. The book generated a lively discussion and there was so much interest in looking deeper into the book that our fellow co-op owner, Dr. Christine Thompson, has generously agreed to give us her insights on the ideas presented in the book. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to attend to. Um, first, if you click on speaker view in the upper right hand part of your screen, you're gonna have a better view of the presentation this evening. Um, second, you can put questions or comments that you have in the chat box um, for Christine. Finally, um, I would like to take a moment to invite anyone who has not yet become a co-op owner um, to consider becoming one. You will always be welcome at any co-op event or to shop at the store, whether you are an owner or not, but by becoming an owner, you're going to get some additional benefits. The store is getting very close to opening. And um, one of the benefits is anyone who becomes a co-op owner before the store opens is considered a founding member and their name will be on our founding members board, which is going to be um, at the store entrance. Um, you can find any information that you need to become an owner on the co-op's website, which is fredericksburgfood.coop or on the co-op's um, Facebook page. Now a little bit about this evening's speaker. Dr. Christine Thompson, um, her first career was as an electrical engineer. She had a second career as a stay-at-home mom. And since 1996, Dr. Thompson has practiced chiropractic and functional nutrition at her wellness center, Whole Health Solutions in downtown Fredericksburg. Her mission is to help people achieve their highest level of wellness and their best quality of life. Her passion is um, correcting her, pair, her patients' underlying imbalances, whether it be through chiropractic alignments or nutrition and lifestyle readjustments. She truly believes that there is always a way to stimulate healing in the body and always hope for improvement in a person's general health outlook. Christine is not only a wonderful co-op owner and supporter, she's lucky enough to live like right around the corner from the store. Um, her presentation this evening will help you wade through the mountains of information and misinformation concerning the basics of healthy eating. She will explain Michael Pollan's three food tenants and summarize his 64 food rules so that you can create a manageable dietary plan for life. So from all of us, welcome, Christine. Um, thank you for joining us this evening, and we're excited to hear about what you have to tell us. Thank you, Linda. I'm You're really welcome. Glad, really glad to be here, and I'm glad to see all these people that are interested in healthy food and food rules. So I'm just gonna share my screen here and bring up my PowerPoint. Okay, so can everybody see that? I hope. <laughs> yes. I don't, yeah, okay, good. All right, so we are going to be summarizing Michael Pollan's book and the, I think one of my favorite things about the book and the purpose of this class is to kind of simplify everything. I feel like there's just a plethora of information, an overabundance of information out there on diet and what you should be eating, what you shouldn't be eating and the latest fad. And sometimes it's hard to wade through all of that. So I'm going to just uh, help to make it a bit simpler, which is what Michael Pollan did beautifully in his book. And it's not that all of these rules are going to apply to everyone. Each person is an individual and has to find the diet that works best for them. But these are some just basic general rules that will help you to, um, to simplify things and then to figure out what works best for you. So we're going to use common sense and we're gonna be thinking about how people are meant to eat. So we're, we're basically thinking about how things were before the 1950s at least, because 
that's when uh, processed food started becoming very common. And we're gonna be thinking about what does food look like? So the very first section of Michael Pollan's book is, is about what should I eat? And his answer is food. <laughs> and so the, the, th the distinction is that most of what's out there in the standard American diet is not food. And Michael Pollan has dubbed it edible food-like substances. And what I tell people is that your what you eat should look like at one time, it could have grown out of the earth or it could have run around on the earth or swam in the ocean or it somehow it looks like it, it could have come from earth. Now it's gonna look a little different after you cook it and make a meal of it, but it should be recognizable as something from nature. So um, one of the general rules that he talks about is to, to shop around the periphery of the grocery store because that's where the real live food is. The produce and the meats and, and dairy and things like that are all around the periphery. And so what's in the middle of the food? Well, it's the processed food, the edible food-like substances. So if you stay out of the middle of the grocery store, you're usually pretty safe. And so I'm gonna tell you a little story about an experiment that I did. This is back a long time ago, probably more than 10 years ago when I started teaching group classes. And, I, and I, so I went to McDonald's one day and I got a hamburger and French fries. And I told them, don't put any condiments on the hamburger. I want just a plain hamburger on a bun, which they thought was really weird, but that's what I got. And so I took the little McDonald's bag and I set it on my kitchen counter and I actually just left it there for a month. And, and then I opened the bag and looked at it. And can you guess what I saw when I opened the bag and looked at it? I bet everybody would guess wrongly because it looked exactly the same. It hadn't spoiled at all. There were no bugs on it. Nothing had tried to eat it. It looked like the bun was a little bit dehydrated, a little bit harder, but the hamburger and french fries looked exactly the same and they smelled like hamburger and french fries. They didn't even smell like rotting food. So that tells you something that it's not real food. And, you know, I have to tell you further, I let it, I just closed up the bag and let it sit on the counter even longer, like months longer. And it still didn't, it never rotted or spoiled. And it still smelled like McDonald's hamburgers and French fries. <laughs> A little bit scary to think about. So my little quip that I like to say is if it doesn't rot or sprout, throw it out when it comes to food because real live food should rot or eventually sprout and try to grow something, right? All right, so let's talk a little bit about advertising. You know, it's kind of um, a strange thing that, that food companies even need to advertise food. Uh, I mean, food, is basic, it's something we need to live. Um, they shouldn't have to advertise it to us, but they have altered it so much. In fact, um, Michael Pollan says that there are 17,000 new products added to grocery stores every year. And I don't think that those new products are things like new varieties of lettuces or apples. I think that he's talking about processed foods. And so once they package it in a box or a bag, they need to tell us what's in there. And a lot of the advertising is very misleading. So you'll see things like healthy and natural, which mean absolutely nothing and uh, don't have to mean any, anything when you put it on advertising. So you want to be careful of the low fat, the non-fat, all those kind of labels. And it's interesting because when they started this whole low fat campaign in the 1970s, ever since then, if you look at statistics, America has gotten fatter. So low fat and non-fat is not the key. And the, the problem, main problem with low fat and non-fat products is that they have taken out the fat and added something else so that it tastes good and you want to eat it. Now you have to remember that all pro processed foods are engineered 
to make us want to buy more and eat more. They are specifically engineered that way. So just kind of keep that in your head when you're looking at these things. But so they've taken out fat, they put on this label, low fat or non-fat, and instead they add sugar or chemicals so that to, to make it taste good. So be really um, very skeptical of labels and what the labels say. Instead, I want you to turn the product over if you decide you're going to buy a processed food and read the label. And mainly you want to read the ingredients. So Michael Pollan's rule is that the less ingredients on the label, the better. And if you don't recognize those words of the, the ingredients on the label, then you probably have a problem. And that's generally very true. So you want fewer ingredients and you want to understand what those ingredients are. They need to sound like food to you. The other thing I really encourage you to look at on the label is the grams of sugar um, because sometimes they've added sugar to the product and they sometimes hide it under different names. So you want to keep those grams of sugar low and you want it to be mainly natural sugars. And I kind of try to keep a rule of not more than five grams of sugar per serving is, is a general rule to follow. A lot of times you find those supposedly healthy protein bars, but they're, the grams of sugar are way up there, 20, 25, 30 grams of sugar in a serving. So about cooking, we happen to live in a culture where people are eating out most of the time, either they're eating out or they're bringing food home that has already been prepared for them, either from the grocery store or from, for take, from takeout, uh, fast food. And the problem with that is you don't really know what is in that food. You don't know how it's been prepared. You don't know where it came from. You don't know what has been added to it. And I will tell you in restaurants, most everything that they that a chef will cook in a restaurant they will add sugar to it why do they do that because we like sugar right we have a natural taste for sugar so they're going to add sugar to it so that it tastes good so you're getting more sugar than you realize if you eat out a lot so i what i would say is to patronize restaurants that are geared toward healthy geared toward um, patronizing local farms, local produce, local meat sources, and um, where that they won't be offended if you ask the chef what's in it. Um, and so if you're going to places where you don't feel comfortable doing that, or they don't want to tell you what's in their food, then I usually say to stick to vegetables and maybe some seafood. And you can always ask if it's wild caught seafood. But um, mainly you want to cook yourself, right? That's the main gist of this is you know, eating food that other people have cooked is always, you're never really sure unless, you, unless they're your friend and you watch them cook it. <laughs> um, Christine, can I interrupt with a question, please? Sure. Um, we've got a question from one of um, the folks that's watching and Rich would like to know how much difference does it make for health if the sugar is from a source like dried fruit as compared with white sugar? So um, white sugar that has been added to something is a lot worse than a natural sugar in a food. So um, I, I would... I would say that it's preferable to just eat the fruit, but if you want dried fruit, there is gonna be a lot more sugar in that because it's condensed. And so it's a smaller piece, but it's the same amount of sugar as if you'd eaten a whole piece of fruit. So you just have to be aware of that if you have sugar issues and you're trying to keep your blood sugar down, which I think we all are trying to do. You wanna limit um, dried fruit, um, stick to mainly whole fresh fruits and you definitely don't want to be eating too many things that have added sugar, added white sugar to them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So now that was part one. Part two of Michael Pollan's book is what kind of food should I eat? And his answer is mostly plants. Pretty simple, right? 
And there's some really good reasons for that. First of all, plants are very nutrient dense, we call it. And that means they are chock full of the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals that we need. And especially the dark green leafy vegetables are really full of that. So you wanna make sure you have some of those frequently every day, hopefully. The other reason, mostly plants, is that they are much easier on the planet. There is not as much energy and resources needed to grow plants as there is to grow livestock. So, um, so much better for global warming and for planet health and, and just for uh, the, the health, um, our health altogether. And then we also know just from a lot of studies that have been done that there are some most definite uh, health benefits to us to have a mostly plants diet. So what I like to say is that at least half of your plate on each meal should be vegetables. And that means even breakfast. And actually one of my favorite breakfasts is to, to uh, saute up a whole handful of vegetables. And um, they, that may sound strange if you're used to tr the traditional American breakfast, but it actually sits on the stomach really nice and it tastes really good in the morning. All right, and so let's move into more about these uh, plants. Uh, plants are actually just fascinating. And um, they, the colors that are in different vegetables denote the, um, the phytochemicals that are in them. So there's all these different nutrients in plants that we call phytochemicals. And these phytochemicals are there on purpose. The plants have developed them to protect themselves, to protect themselves from pests that um, will eat their leaves and, and destroy them or eat their roots and also from diseases that tend to affect them. And the most amazing thing about this is that these wonderful plants that have developed these capabilities, when we eat them, they do the same thing for us. They protect us against diseases and they help us to be healthier. So um, I just think, you know, we could actually do a whole class on that, <laughs> on, the, on the colors of um, vegetables. And so these specific nutrients create these specific colors. So you wanna have a diet that has um, varied colors in it. And it doesn't mean that every single meal you have to have all the different colors of the rainbow on your plate. It just means that say over a week's worth of time, you wanna have a lot of different colors mixed in with your fruits and vegetables. So that brings us to talking about animals and livestock. And the general rule is um, that we want to think of animal protein or muscle meat from an animal, we wanna think of that as a condiment on our plate. So we have this plate that is at least half or more vegetables, and then we can put a, a piece of animal meat on there. And the animal meat should be, I'm gonna say no more than three or four ounces, but a good way to measure it is the size, no more than the size of the palm of your hand. And the, the most important thing that I think about animal uh, protein is that the animals that you are eating have eaten well. And, and that's what Michael Pollan says in his book. And I totally agree with that. Unfortunately, most livestock, uh, conventional livestock today is not being fed a natural diet. So cows are not meant to eat corn. They are meant to eat grass, all sorts of different wild grasses that grow naturally out there. And chickens are meant to eat bugs and worms and you know peck things out of the soil. And then fish should be swimming wild and eating whatever they eat, whether it's plants or other fish or whatever it is that they eat in the ocean or the lake or the stream where they live. And they should, so farmed fish are fed some pretty odd diets. That's another thing we could do a whole class on. <laughs> the odd diets that we have taken to feeding 
the uh, animals in the American diet. It's kind of strange. And you should mainly, the, the main thing here is that we want to eat a wide diversity of foods. Uh, we have an unfortunate situation going on in farming today where we have what's called a monoculture, meaning that we are only growing certain crops anymore. And it's basically corn, wheat, soy, and sugar. And, um, and that creates a lot of problems. And one of the problems that is being created is that our soils are being depleted of the uh, minerals, the nutrients that are needed in the soil um, in order to grow healthy food for us to be healthy. And we also want to, so there's three groups of food actually. Most people think it's just two, plant and animal, but fungi are a whole group to their own. They are not a plant or animal and they pro provide some very unique nutrients. And I could really go off on that because I am so just enamored with mushrooms and uh, all of their nutrients and the, the health benefits that we get from them. And, um, and I could go on and on about a lot more with mushrooms, but I won't because we don't have time tonight. Maybe we'll do a class on mushrooms. <laughs> Would you <laughs> have a chance to answer a couple questions? Yes, that have come sure, in? go ahead. Okay. Um, Els was wondering if there's a difference in nutritional value between um, vegetables and fruits that you eat, which are cooked versus raw. Yeah, any cooking that we do will kill some of the live enzymes. And if they're cooked too much, you can start to kill some of the vitamins. You'll usually still get as many minerals out of them. Um, but some, some vegetables, you need to cook them to get the nutrients out of them. And that's also true of uh, fungi, of mushrooms. You have to cook them in order to get the nutrient value out of them. So um, like uh, cruciferous vegetables, you need to cook them because we don't digest them that well otherwise. And so you get more nutrient value if you do cook them. You just don't wanna overcook. Mm -hmm. And then the other question that's come in about what you've recently been talking about is how concerned should we be with the plastics found in wild fish? Yeah, that's a concern. Plastics are just a concern altogether. Um, you want to reduce as plastics as much as you can, but I'm going to tell you that it's impossible. We, we breathe in plastic on a daily basis. So you can worry about that if you want to. Um, I choose to just believe that eating the wild fish is going to be better than eating the farm fish. And that's the best I can do right now, unless I start, you know, unless we're able to do something about the plastic problem. Thank you. Is that it? That's it for now. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think that was everything on this one. Um, and then the next topic is fermented foods, which I'm, I'm so glad that he included in the book because it's kind of a newer thing that has become popular. But I have to tell you that every indigenous culture that is out there has some sort of fermented food that is a staple part of their diet until you get to the American standard American diet. And then there was no fermented foods, but now people are starting to add those in. And um, they're a very important part of the diet. Um, they, they add some of the the good flora that we need in our intestines to help our immune system to be healthy, to cut down on inflammation, to help us make some of our vitamins. Um, so they're, they're just, I feel like they're essential. And so it's one of the things that I always recommend is some sort of fermented food or beverage. They take getting used to for people who aren't used to them. Um, they can have strong tastes, but I highly recommend that you start experimenting with them and and, and they're really fun to make on your own. And have we had classes on that? I can't remember if there's been a fermentation class, but that's a really fun oh, class. Oh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. That's a really fun class to have. Now let's talk a little bit about grains. Um, grains are very difficult to digest. 
for our particular digestive system. Um, so, so they um, have to be handled properly. Less processing, but we need to include um, we need to to include the whole grain. So we want the fiber, we want the germ that has all the nutrients and the omega threes in it. We want all the part of the grain. Um, we won't, don't want just the, the like white flour, like with wheat, we don't want only the starchy part because that's just empty calories that don't have all, all the good nutrients in it. Um, and our body actually handles it just like it handles sugar when it's um, been devoid of all the fiber and nutrients. However, grains need to be partially processed the way we were talking about with fermentation. So the old school way of making bread is that they allowed the bread to ferment. So they, they let it rise over a period of time, usually about 17 hours. And when you do that, it breaks down the gluten molecule, which is very hard for us to digest. So um, that's so that breads can end up becoming very, very healthful. They just need to be cooked properly and um, prepared properly, and then we are able to di digest them better. There are some grains that are actually fairly easy to digest. These are some things like quinoa and um, sometimes rice. Rice is usually very easy to digest. So there are some grains that are easier than wheat to digest. As far as oils go, we want to make sure that they are not processed a lot and there's not a lot of steps to their processing. There aren't chemicals being used to process them and not heat being used to process them because a lot of these oils are very delicate and the heat damages them and turns them into trans fats. So we want cold pressed oils and um, we want to make sure that we only cook with oils that can withstand high heat. So that's another subject that's important. We don't want to be cooking with the real polyunsaturated, uh, high content polyunsaturated oils like, um, like our omega-3s and omega-6s and vegetable oils and things like that don't withstand heat very well and become trans fats. So we want to cook with the ones that have a higher content of monounsaturates or saturated fats, okay? All right, so let me see here. Next is supplements. And this was a little bit harder rule for me with Michael Pollan because I'm a big supplement person, <laughs> but I actually totally agree with him. So what Michael Pollan says is to uh, think like a person, think and act like a person who takes supplements, but don't take the supplements. And what he means is that somebody who takes supplements is generally think more uh, health minded and thinking about their health more than somebody that doesn't take supplements usually. And so he's saying that it's better to get your nutrients from food. And I absolutely totally agree. We need to be getting our nutrients from food. But where I kind of differ from Michael Pollan is that I have, uh, um, I know that our soils have been very depleted because of farming methods, because we're not farming properly and restoring the, the nutrient content, content of the soil. We deplete the, the soils and they get depleted of quite a few um, of the minerals in particular. And we know for certain that our soils are depleted of magnesium. So I believe that there are some reasons why we need to take some supplements. However, I, I do believe that the, these supplements should be food-based supplements. I call them whole food supplements, meaning that the, the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals have been um, got taken out of food and not made in a laboratory. So the ones that are made in a laboratory, we call them synthetic supplements. And the research is very, very clear on this. There's been a couple of long-term studies done with supplements, vitamin, particular vitamins, vitamin, uh, I think they've used vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, those types of vitamins. And what they find routinely 
long term is the people taking these supplements get worse over time. They end up sicker with more disease and they get worse. What they don't tell you in this in the studies is that they're using synthetic mega dose supplements. And that is something that will definitely get you out of balance. So you don't want to take synthetic mega dose so, uh, vitamins long term. And you know, I don't know if that makes sense to you all or not, but if you need more information, you can ask me about it, what I mean by that. All right, so everybody's favorite subject to take part in, but not to talk about <laughs> is our sweet tooth. Um, so we, we are just genetically made to, we have evolved into beings who love sugar. We just have a taste for sugar and um, which was not a problem up until maybe about a hundred years ago, sugar was actually very expensive and there was, and it wasn't around in abundance. And so if you were, you could make things that were sugary um, or you could just save your sugar for very special occasions, but it wasn't like people were making sweets daily or eating sweets daily because it was so expensive. Well, that's not true today. Sugar is very, very cheap and you can make all kinds of sweets with tons of sugar, but it's very bad for us. Sugar is extremely inflammatory to our bodies, to our blood vessels, and it is a major cause of heart disease and diabetes. So very bad for us for a number of reasons that we don't have time to explain fully, but take my word for it. Um, so we want to just save sugary treats and junk food for just occasional, 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 uh, very occasional and special occasions for celebrating. And uh, one thing that Michael Pollan points out in his book is that people who make their own French fries or potato chips don't eat very much of them because they take so long and they, they require so much effort to make when you do them yourself. So his rule is just always make your sweets and your, your junk food yourself. And if you make it yourself, you're not gonna overdo on it because it's a lot of effort to make them. So always don't buy any, just make it yourself. So you don't have to uh, deprive yourself of your favorites. Christine, we have quite a few comments and okay. questions that have come in. Okay. Would okay. this be a good time to address them? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, Selma wants, um, she commented that she has heard that a vast majority of monocultured crops are grown to feed livestock, um, which I think we all pretty... Um, we've heard that before. Um, and now on to the questions. Um, Andy said that um, while you were talking about microplastics, would it be better to use sea salt or mine salt? He's heard that sea salt is reported to have trace amounts of microplastic beads and particles, whereas salt that is mined does not. And um, is iodine you know, an important factor in either of those? Yeah, you know, it's, um, iodine is an essential mineral for our, that our body needs to make certain hormones and it's very important. So when they started iodizing salt, it was for a reason. It was because people were deficient and needed it. And um, they're starting to see that again so yes, iodine is important. Um, these microplastics are a real problem. And I, I, I don't have an answer on that because sea salt has some other nutrients in it that are good. Um, and mined salt may not, depending on how they're mining, where they're getting it and, um, and how they processed it. So I don't have an answer on that. And the microplastic thing is just a conundrum that I don't have an answer on right now, okay. except to um, just help your body detox the plastics and um, try to stay away from as much other plastics as you can in your, 
I tell people not to ever eat or drink from plastic or, or even store their food in it, just as a general rule to try to avoid more plastics as okay. much as we can. Um, and a question about oils. Diana was wondering what oils should we be using to cook with high heat? Okay, so when you want to cook with high heat, you need to do, you need to use oils that have a higher saturated fat content. So that's going to be um, coconut oil is going to have your highest saturated fat content. Um, peanut oil is more of a, a monounsaturate. Um, and avocado oil, more of a monounsaturate. Um, but you can use um, butter if you don't have a dairy problem. Ghee, if you do have a dairy problem, those are saturated fats that do well with cooking. Um, if you have can find organic lard, you know, anything like that that um, is high in saturated fat content is good for cooking. Hot, high heat cooking, I should say. Now, if you're just sauteing at a low heat, you can even use olive oil is fine for low heat um, sauteing. But you know, if you're going to fry something, you want the higher saturated fat content. Okay. But don't, don't cook it all with any of the polyunsaturates, like the omega-3s, omega-6s, the vegetable oils, you know. Okay. And then two questions about sugars. Rich said that he finds it easy to eat a lot of fruits and whole grains and that he eats more fruits than vegetables. And he was wondering what would be the optimal mix? Uh, to me, the optimal mix is twice as many vegetables to fruits. But that is, you know, I, in my work, I'm dealing mostly with people who are having blood sugar issues. So whenever anybody already has a blood sugar or a weight issue, a weight gaining issue, I'm going to tell them to eat twice as many vegetables as fruit. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the final question that has come in is, um, Chris was wondering, what about stevia? Yeah, stevia is a nice option. It, um, it doesn't have any effect on blood sugar. Um, it has a little bit of a bitter aftertaste, um, but it, it won't spike insulin or blood sugar. So it's a pretty good option. My only thing is I would say it still promotes that whole sweet taste. It, it, it's, it encourages you to want everything sweet. So if you, so I would say use stevia, but slowly decrease the amount and start getting yourself used to not such a sweet, sweet taste with everything. Thank you. Okay. Ready? Back okay. to you. Okay, good. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about traditional food cultures. Um, it turns out that you could pick almost any other traditional food culture in the world and it would be healthier than the standard American diet. How about that? <laughs> and they've actually, they've looked at this a lot and the standard American diet is the most unhealthy diet that you could possibly eat. <laughs> So um, that said, the reason why these traditional cultures uh, with all these varieties of food, I mean, some of these cultures are in direct polar opposite to each other as far as what they eat, but they all turn out to promote health. And it's because they have been passed down through generation to generation to generation. And these cultures have figured out what works the best for them as far as what foods to combine, how to prepare the foods, how they need to be grown, um, you know, what, what tastes the best together. And, um, and then they also have developed their own cultural habits around food and meal time and what that means to them. And um, so, so I think we, we just need to experiment with uh, the, the foods of other cultures and try some different things and, and see, um, and then maybe just investigate why have they combined these different things and what does that provide for us nutritionally or digestively? 
And then another thing Michael Pollan stresses is that we should all be just a bit skeptical of innovation and changes and mutations in foods. And I think it's a very valid point. I think that until something has been tried and true, we, we need to just be a little wary of it, maybe not dive right into the latest fad, but see if it really proves to be something good. You know, one of the thing he, things he talks about in the book is soy. And soy is a very uh, old tradition in many Asian cultures. Most of the time they use it uh, as, a, as a condiment to meals, not as the main part of their meal. And they have most of the time have fermented the soy into uh, miso, tempa, you know, all the different forms of fermented soy. But today we end up having these iso, soy isoflavones, soy protein isolate, textured vegetable protein, all these different forms of soy that are brand new to us. And um, we're not really sure if they're very good. And the problem is, you, I challenge you to pick, the, pick up a box or a bag in the grocery store, processed food, and not see soy somewhere on the label in one of those forms. It's, it's really um, everywhere in processed food. And the problem becomes that we are slow evolvers as human beings, homo sapiens. We, we don't evolve very quickly. And so we don't, uh, we're not able to evolve to these quick changes in our food source and in our environment, the way some other life forms are like microbes, goodness, they're, they're evolving and changing their DNA daily, where it takes us generations to do this and to evolve to these changes. So we just need to be a little bit careful when it comes to um, big innovations and, and changes in food. And then of course, we need to always mention alcohol, which is, um, can be a controversial subject when it comes to nutrition and, and all people, all practitioners in nutrition have their own idea about it. I personally agree with what Michael Pollan says. There is substantial evidence that things like red wine in moderation with food has um, some, some health benefits to it. And basically we want, we want to keep that idea of moderation in mind alcohol is a form of sugar. And so anyone with a um, blood sugar issue uh, or liver problem or anything like that, of course, is going to need to avoid alcohol together. But for most people, for moderation means for men, two drinks a day and for women, one drink a day. But the thing to keep in mind is that uh, our liver oxidizes alcohol at the rate of one ounce of 100% alcohol every two hours. So it takes two hours to oxidize an ounce of 100% alcohol. So, you know, uh, you have to determine for yourself. I, I do believe that red wine has some health benefits to it when uh, taken in moderation. So that moves us into part three. And um, I move this thing my little thing here of uh, our pictures keep getting in the way of me, <laughs> of me seeing what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so the uh, part three is how, I, oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I went one too far. Whoops, what did I do here? There we go, um, sorry about that. Okay, so part three is how should I eat? And Michael Pollan's answer to that is not too much. Great answer, right? <laughs> not too much. So what does that mean? Well, I'm gonna go back to a traditional culture and um, it's the French. And we call it the French paradox because when you look at what we're, what's good and what's bad and what we're supposed to eat, we're not supposed to. And you look at the French, people say, well, the French, they eat all the things we're not supposed to. They have all these pastries and these, these rich cheeses and they drink wine with every meal. And 
Um, but the thing that you need to look at with the French culture, they do all those things, but they, they also eat a lot of vegetables. They eat pretty well. Um, but, but what they also do is they eat on little plates and they have little portions. They don't go back for seconds and meals are quite an event. It's a leisurely event shared with family and friends, enjoyed, appreciated. Um, so it's a, a whole different event. I mean, when I say those words, do you think of the American culture and the way we eat? Do we sit for long periods of time and enjoy the food and I eat on little tiny plates? Mm. <laughs> no, no. I mean, maybe you do. The people I'm probably taught, uh, preaching to the choir here, but um, most Americans are eating fast food and uh in fact, Michael Pollan said somewhere in the book that um, a fifth of all meals, yeah, it was a fifth of all meals are eaten in the car now in America. <laughs> it's a sad statement. And I have to admit that I've eaten in the car. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to admit because when you think about it, it's really kind of crazy, isn't it? So, um, so when we when we talk about not eating too much, we kind of have to change the what, how we think about food and meals. And so I want to just put out these statistics. Um, wait a minute, did I skip one? Yeah, no. Okay, we're right. Okay, so I want to put out these statistics. So in in these are from uh, John Robbins from an interview in 2014. So there's newer statistics, but I, I couldn't find them. So in 1950, Americans spent 22% of their disposable income on food. And they spent 5% of their disposable income on healthcare. So they spent four times as much on food as their healthcare in 1950. And then we jumped to 2013 and Americans spent 9% of their dis disposable income on food and 18% on healthcare. So we jumped to 63 years and all of a sudden we're spending twice as much on healthcare than food when we were spending a quarter as much on healthcare as food. So people have this perception that food is expensive and that we're spending too much on food and that it ought to be cheap. And I think that this is, um, I think that McDonald's and Burger King and all the fast food places are responsible for this because they're putting out this stuff that is edible food-like substances. It's not real food and they're selling it at really cheap prices and making people think that real food, real plants and animals are really expensive when they're not. It's just our perception has changed so much from these processed foods that we're being fed. So what I say to people is, where do you wanna spend your money? On the front end with good healthy food or on the back end with your healthcare because you're gonna, you're gonna really need it if you're not spending the money on the good healthy food. So does it take a lot of money to eat healthy? Well, relatively, yes. It takes more money than it, than it takes to eat crummy edible food-like substances, but not really. If, if that's important to you and it's a priority, you can eat pretty healthy on a reasonable amount of money if you really put an effort into it. All right, so we need to we need to eat less. So, so how do we do that when we're used to in America? You go into a restaurant and they serve you this gigantic plate heaped with food, and we all go, "Wow, look at that! Look at the value of that!" So we have to change our whole mindset, and we have to it, it do it step by step, and we have to. Um, just be diligent about it and, and have some discipline about it and, real, and recognize that it might be hard at first, but it's gonna pay off in the end. So 
one of the things that Michael Pollan points out is that our brain does not register the full sensation for 20 minutes after we're actually full. So if you're eating like we Americans eat, <laughs> shoveling that food in, you're going to you're going to be full and not realize it for another 20 minutes. So you could potentially eat for another 20 minutes past being full. So we have to get used to stopping before we're full, get used to maybe feeling still feeling a little hungry. Uh, when we stop eating, we need to get ourselves some little plates and serve ourselves little portions and um, not go back for seconds. We need to enjoy our food. We need to eat more slowly, really taste each bite and appreciate it and um, uh, ex explore our food, get used to new tastes. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, that I think is interesting is that in, in America, we've lost some of the appreciation of the bitter taste because we're so, uh, we, we so much prefer the sweet taste that we want everything sweet. And there's, there are bitter vegetables and herbs out there that are very important and very beneficial to our health. And, and people don't like them because they're, they taste bitter. All right, so meals, how do we do this? So how do we wanna space out our meals? Do we, how often do we eat? How many meals do we eat? These are questions that I get very frequently. And um, there's actually some pretty easy answers. Um, back before the advent of the agricultural revolution, um, their food was not so abundant. You know, back when people were hunter gatherers, food was not abundant. So there were sometimes stretches of time where there wasn't much food available. And there were even times when there was no food available. And so we, in, in evolutionary wise and our, our DNA, we are geared toward periods of time when there's not food available. So our bodies, are always storing up everything and trying to make us gain weight because our bodies are thinking there's gonna become a time of famine and they gotta get ready for it. So, um, having, so eating discrete meals, not snacking all day. Remember the back, uh, ways back when they told you, oh, you should be just kind of nibbling all day. You should be just, and that's actually not true the way our bodies physiologically, the way our bodies are made, we want to have time in between meals for digestion, absorption of nutrients, for elimination. There's got to be stretches of time when we're not eating for all of this to happen properly. So, um, so we definitely want specific meal times and not snacking between. And it turns out that fasting, which has been a part of most uh indigenous cultures for for eons is actually a very good thing for us it's good for our health it's good for longevity anti-aging has a lot of benefits for certain um, degenerative diseases that are really killing america like heart disease and diabetes and things like that respond really well to um to fasting so um, so there's the new thing called intermittent fasting, where you just you uh, keep your eating to within certain hours of the day, and then you try to stretch out a longer period where you're not eating during that 24 hour period. And, and probably most important is to, to share your meals, to eat at a table, to eat with others, to eat with friends and family. We might have to start doing, doing Zoom eating. <laughs> soon here. Um, uh, but, you know, to, to enjoy your meals. And I just wanted to mention before we end that um, there are, ex there are always times for exceptions. I, I'm not an 100% person. I believe that um, there are always times when we can stray from the rules. So I believe in what I call the 80-20 rule. You've probably heard of it before. It just means that if 80% of the time 
you pretty much stick to these basic rules, then you can afford around 20% of the time to fudge with them a little bit. Doesn't mean go hog wild for that 20%. And it also doesn't mean to start stretching that 20% to 30% and 40% and 50%. So you wanna, you wanna keep it to 80-20 and do the best you can, but, but to not make it an all or nothing deal so that you uh, can have your special occasions, your celebrations, that you can join your friends when they want to go somewhere um, and, and live your life and uh, enjoy some of the things that, that you don't necessarily want to be doing all the time, but can, do, can, can indulge in once in a while. And then just to kind of conclude everything and, and give you like a, a synopsis, we, we want to change our attitude about food. We want to become more involved with our food and you know uh, probably the the uh, greatest thing you could do would be to grow your own vegetables so if you're growing your own vegetables then you know that your soil is not depleted that you've put all the minerals into the soil and that it has compost in it and you're growing good organic vegetables and you you know what's going into your body and then if you can't grow your own garden, maybe you can at least do the preparation of the meals and, and cook your meals for yourself. But most of all, you really want to enjoy your meals. You want to explore food, try different things and be grateful for what you have and just kind of be easy on yourself. Make it a fun process. Don't make it uh, something that is a, uh, these rules end up becoming like a heavy burden on you. Uh, um, I kind of don't, don't even like to think of them as rules, but as um, suggestions for healthy living or guidelines to follow that kind of thing. Because rules for some people sounds like something to buck, right? <laughs> so that was pretty much, um, everything I had. Oh, here's one other quote from Michael Pollan. He said that gas stations now make more money on food and cigarettes than on gas. That's an interesting statement on, um, on American lifestyle, isn't it? So that was pretty much all I had, I think. Yep, it is. So if we had some more questions, I'm glad to answer those. We do, we do. Um, Deborah was wondering, where does oatmeal fall as a good food? Oatmeal is a good food. It, um, it's one of the grains that is easier to digest. I should have mentioned that. And uh, has some, some definite health benefits, has a lot of fiber to it. Um, I think that the best oatmeal is the whole oats so that and you're getting more fiber. Um, and um, the steel cut oats are a good option too. And, uh, and for people who are gluten sensitive, of course, making sure that they're, they're gluten free, which they should be, but sometimes they add gluten. <laughs> um, Diana has a comment that um, kind of addresses the fact that we overeat. Um, she suggests that when you go to a restaurant, bring a to-go dish with a cover and put half your meal in the dish before you even start to eat. That's a sounds, great suggestion. Sounds great, yeah. Um, and Els was wondering, is it more important to eat only when you're hungry or at set times? So, you know, it's a hard question to answer because most of us are on schedules these days. So we have certain times when we can eat. It's, all, of course, always better to eat when you're hungry. And, and not just to eat or just because it's a meal time, but that, that doesn't always work for everybody. If this is your lunch time and this is when you can eat, then you need to eat then. But yeah, certainly always better if you can just wait until you're hungry. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, Selma was wondering, um, it, what is the best way to do intermittent fasting? So the suggested way, and the, the way I suggest anyway, is uh, two or three days a week, 
uh, or more, you can do more, but, but at least two or three days a week to make your window of eating between six hours or eight hours at the most. And so that leaves a window of 16 to 18 hours where you're not eating. So one example would be to um, not eat anything after eight o'clock at night. And then if you didn't eat again until um, two o'clock that next day, that would be, is that right? Did I do the math right? No. Well, anyway, so it would be 16 hours from eight o'clock at night. So you'd probably have stopped eating at six o'clock at night. And then you wouldn't eat again until um, six plus, yeah, mm -hmm. you wouldn't eat again until noon the next day. Yeah. So if you stopped eating at six o'clock at night and didn't eat until noon the next day, that would be um, 18 hours. That'd be 18 hours of not eating. So that's one example. Okay. But you can do, it doesn't matter where you push that window. You just want between 16 to 18 hours of not eating is, is considered an intermittent fasting. And you're drinking water, of course, during that time, but you're just not eating food mm -hmm. or drinking beverages that have calories. Okay. Um, Marsha was, um, has another point about the bringing your own container to restaurants. She said mm -hmm. it's critical because you um, can divide the food and you also will reduce waste. Two great yes. important points. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and we're getting so many comments from um, the people who have attended that you know are thanking you for your presentation this evening because they're they're all loving it. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm very glad. It's yeah. a fun class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, I believe we're a little bit over the hour. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Nope, that was it. Okay. Sorry about that. It took okay. longer. Does than anyone thought. have any more questions? We'll wait a minute or two to see if any more come in. Um, I do have a question while we're waiting to see if anybody wants to ask anything else. But um, as someone who advocates for lifestyle and dietary changes to provide well being, what do you consider to be the most important factor? to have a successful adoption and continuation of your changes? I think that it's your attitude about it. I think that you have to um, enjoy the process and be committed to your health. So it's really uh, the, your success is gonna be determined by your attitude. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've just always found through the years that you could be doing everything just right according to the rules, but if you have a negative attitude about it or stressing yourself out about it, you kind of ruin everything that you're doing. So uh, when, when people tell me, well, I'm just absolutely can't do this, then we don't do that because I know that thing is going to stress them out and we're going to pick something <laughs> they can do. There's always changes you can make that are that fit into your lifestyle. Thank you. Um, Christine, I want to say thank you for a wonderful presentation this evening. And I feel like I'm speaking for everyone um, that has been on this Zoom session when I say you've given us all so much to think about. And um, I would also like to thank everyone who has joined us this evening for the presentation. We're honored by your presence and your wonderful questions and comments. So thank you to everyone, presenters and attendees. Thank, thank you, you everybody. everybody for coming. It's been thank great. You. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks very much.